So uh, I started off with the design problem solving in the Anthropocene, but actually the, the, the uh, presentation became landscape in the era of fear and xenophobia, and then most recently became the assimilative capacity of. And that's where I want to stop in terms of the, thinking about this, because we are on a sphere that is orbiting uh, in, a, in a, a, a galaxy, in a solar system, in a huge universe. It goes well beyond that, um, but we are very fragile in the context of this. And we see this polarization, these extremes happening in the context of climate change, which we'll hear about more in a second. Um, uh, but this notion that there are these extremes that we have to live by that is the new norm um, is incredibly fascinating um, in, in the cap capacity that uh, the assimilative capacity, of, assimilative capacity of nature is that threshold where you just can't take any more, right? Something's going to break. It's all going to fall apart if we if we if we pass a certain point, and we're in that uh, uh, that point of vulnerability in our own globe. Um, but I want to also speak to the fact that we might actually be um, at that uh, simulative capacity of ourselves, and really that's where this uh, discussion has morphed into. And so um, I want to start here with a Swanson TV dinner. Um, and actually my childhood and uh, sitting at the kitchen counter on date night when my parents would be out having a good time, we were left at the kitchen counter uh, watching television. Uh, I'm 55, um, so I grew up with this show, uh, Star Trek. I'm sure this is the first time that the APS has ever, ever had Star Trek up on their screen. I just want to point that out. Um, and the notion is this. I don't know whether the sci-fi nerds in the audience can actually identify this particular episode. I have had audiences who knew it. This is called The Empath, right? And The Empath episode is one where the guys in silver, who are, who are recognized as the aliens, aliens always wear silver, um, that they have captured the three guys from Star Trek and tortured them. They've also abducted this young lady who is an empath. The, the, uh, the goal of the aliens was to uh, enter into a, uh, a universe where there was about to be a supernova. There were three planets orbiting that sun, each with viable civilizations. They captured one person from each of those worlds to test them to see whether they were worthy of being saved. And uh, in the end, the empath, who was a mute, um, her, her notion was that she could heal those who were afflicted through touch by absorbing their affliction into herself and, and then healing herself. And um, what they did was they tortured Dr. McCoy to a point of, of, of an inch of his life, and uh, the goal was to see whether uh, she would touch him and absorb his pain. And in the end, uh, she does. She absorbs his pain. Uh, she collapses near death, and the aliens carry her off and decide to save her civilization out of all the three. The empathic society is saved as a result of the capacity to give. So, um, my studio is based on empathy. We have an empathy-driven design studio. It's actually based on my own DNA. I chart really high on empathy. I have a capacity to give beyond myself to problem solve on behalf of my clients and my constituents. And to be very crass, uh, empathy is profitable. <laughs> to think beyond oneself is actually not inappropriate, people, right? You can actually have a thriving practice. We started six years ago. We're now up to 15. I practice across the country and a little bit in Europe. Um, the studio is right around the corner. I invite you to visit it. It's on 2nd Street uh, between Market and Arch. We have a gallery component associated with that um, that shows landscape-related issues from ecologists, anthropologists, sociologists, and other designers and artists. Um, it also houses my antique garden tool collection um, from the 1700s, 1800s and 1900s. Um, in that studio, we have two universal truths, the first of which is this, a belief in gravity. The notion that this no Newtonian thing, this orb that falls from the Earth, um, touches the common ground, that connective tissue on which we all stand, and as a result, unifies us as a society. And that's the power of landscape. And our goal is actually to create humanist constructs that allow people of very different ilks, say a chemistry professor and a young protester who wouldn't normally speak with one, each one another, to sit in a condition of adjacency because they want to. And a result, as a result of that adjacency, they have a conversation, that conversation comes up with an idea, and that idea 10 years down the road saves the world. We will have been successful. Not because we're smart enough to come up with the idea that saves the world, but we are smart enough to 
come up with human constructs where conversation takes place. And in an era of nationalism and xenophobia, conversations are the things that are most important because we are only separated by minute particles of DNA and cultural nuance in the context of who we are. So landscap, which is the archaic English, or landskip, which is the archaic Dutch, um, is about this single point of view of the broad horizon. And it's that broad horizon that has these extraordinary systems, both sociological, anthropological, ecological, uh, uh, that we work in, and that's the realm of landscape architecture. Uh, but most importantly, it carries the spectrum of our humanity in it. Landscape architects embrace all of those conditions in the work that they do in, within that connective tissue in terms of design problem solving. And it's those places that are loved, with the heart and the mind that will last. Those are the places, whether they are supposed to be protected as full-on nature or whether they are social constructs, that if people love them, they will last. If people do not love them in the Anthropocene, they go away. We are the dominant species. We have control. If we don't love it, it's gone, right? So we have to make sure that people love these things. I am an insomniac. I inherited that from my late father. There are three books. One is uh, Marcus Aurelius's uh, Meditations. This is the Hicks Brothers version. This reminds me that human beings have not changed in 2,500 years. This man loves, loathes, fears all the things that we do emotively. He did 2,500 years ago on the outstretches of Austria, protecting his world from what he did not know. There's also Palasmus, The Eyes of the Skin, uh, which is a treatise on form-based architecture and why that is a bad thing, that we should actually be designing in humanist constructs to remember that it's the human being that engages in this. And my fear is that landscape architecture is heading towards form-based solutions, not spatially-based solutions. And then finally, uh, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. And this is where I want to apologize, Dr. Faber. I, I apologize for this, what you're about to see. Uh, <laughs> so Stephen Hawking actually wanted to be a landscape architect. He didn't realize it at the time. I want to explain to you why. <laughs> so the general, his goal was actually to marry the general theory of relativity with quantum physics. And the notion was that that, that union was the capacity to, to describe everything. Um, and uh, it's that union that, that I think is most important. His notion in the, in the, in the general theory of relativity is that there's a, uh, the flash of light is the constant, right? It's the thing that moves out at the known speed. And you can map that because it emanates spherically. And when you map it in the case of, of space and time, as it gets larger and larger, you actually have the capacity to draw what he described as the future light cone. All the things that emanated from that event is the future light cone. All the things that came towards that event are the, the uh, past light cone, with the event being that flash of light, right? And so what's fascinating is everything outside of the past and future light cone is the elsewhere of P, which I think is a really cool thing. The elsewhere of P is the point of vacuum between all those other things, the things that did not inform what happened. Um, and that's the difference that actually I want you to, to uh, uh, appreciate, is when we map the future light cone and we put it on a plane and we recognize, as um, Einstein did, that everybody experiences time differently, um, that this becomes incredibly important as describing ourselves. We each understand time differently. So if we map this against the plane of landscape, right, and that we move through time, the ultimate goal is the unification of those spheres, those unions become the points of conversation where each of these future light cones is actually ourselves. Um, and uh, when you marry that to the notion of randomness in quantum physics, that serendipitous encounter um, ends up being that point of conversation where you end up saying hello and as a result come up with that big idea. That's why he wanted to be a landscape architect. This is actually what I do, and it's kind of wonderful. He gave a great poetic uh, description of the, of the things that I do. So it's that flash of light, that thing that resonates within us, and like Peter, actually, I went to a Quaker institution. Um, I am a secular humanist, but I know that there is the light within each of us that makes us individuals, and when you can work as a landscape architect to marry those flashes of light together, they become incredibly powerful, beautiful things. The second universal truth for our studio is this. Mean people suck, right? <laughs> the notion is that meanness is actually the deprivation of kindness. And, in, and um, uh, so our goal as landscape architects is actually to promote kindness through conversation and understanding. Um, this is Lorenzetti's The Allegory of Good Government in Town Hall of Siena, where uh, to this day, elected, elected officials vote 
uh, or, or enact their powers. Um, the bastardized uh, uh, Latin here is, uh, where justice rules, the people shall be governed by the common good or the common ground. I had the opportunity to go to the Mayor's Institute of, uh, of City Design. I was the sole landscape architect brought in amongst uh, architects and uh, economists and planners to discuss the challenges of urban environments. I was given three minutes to describe what I do as a landscape architect and to try to get them away from the progressive verb of landscaping or curb appeal, um, and the, the notion that um, we do more than uh, create beauty. Um, so I showed them my hometown, our hometown, Philadelphia, uh, as a Noli map. The private is the uh, dark, the public is the white. I inverted it, um, and I put a, a, a ring around a per, per portion of uh, the city, and I quantified it, saying that the total acreage within that red zone is 4,285. Buildings represent 1,704. My area of expertise, which is everything else, is 2,500 acres. Um, the notion is that building architects design buildings for specific types of people. Landscape architects design spaces um, between those buildings and sometimes on top of them, and the constituency is significantly broader. Um, and that it's the notion that the least expensive thing that you can modify, do to modify the environment is affect the public realm, um, which affects the greatest number of constituents, and by the way, those people vote. Suddenly, those mayors had light bulbs going off in front of me when they realized that affecting the public realm could actually change their capacity to govern, which I thought was really cool, especially uh, in an era when um, more and more have less and less. The person in pink is the person who has the most. Everybody else has significantly less. Landscape is the most equitable environment in which to affect positive change for communities. So when you think about the economic uh, environment, or excuse me, the landscape uh, uh, and it's, it's the broad horizon view, you also have to remember that there's the landscape of economics um, and there's also the political landscape. And I wanna just point something out here which is landscapes are inherently politically charged. They are incredibly powerful tools um, and are representative of culture in every respect. This is the same place, Chiswick House, in, uh, out just, you can actually go visit it in London. Um, in 1707 on the left, in 1730 on the right, something happened. It's called the Age of Enlightenment. It's when the Whig Party began to rise up in the context of the death of Queen Anne and the parliamentary representation began to be powerful. They were looking for a language to represent themselves in the context of cultural identity. They were recognized that they had adopted previously the language of, of monarchs, in particular parterre gardens and other forms um, that described something wholly different. Um, what was interesting that the serendipity of quantum physics allowed these two gentlemen to meet in the Grand Tour of Rome, William Kent on the left and the, uh, the third Earl of Burlington, uh, Richard Boyle on the right. Um, together, they invented a language for the Whig Party and a, a new representation of governance. Um, they changed uh, the Earl's house at Chiswick from the Jacobian Manor to the form on the right, which is this sort of Roman temple that was critically challenged as being too small to live in, too large for a watch fob but it was symbolic, right? And the notion was that the landscape had changed, the parterres were erased for lawn, statuary was represented at the ends of these ellipses. In this case, in his, his landscape, Caesar and Pompey are confronted by Cicero, Cicero being the democratic principles, uh, Caesar and Pompey being the empirical powers. Um, and it's no wonder that we have a language here of Roman temples and obelisks. Kent went on to design uh, Rousham, uh, a, a highly charged, landscape in terms of politics. Um, in particular, in the distance, he took a working mill and clad it with a, a Gothic temple uh, structure, and in the distance, uh, informed uh, the eye catcher, which is this kind of ruined Roman arch within the barley fields of England saying we are the inheritors of the republicanism, lowercase r, of, of the Roman uh, uh, origins. Um, you go out into that, my husband and I had the opportunity to walk out into that barley field and took this picture um, of the Triumphal Arch and uh, it is a stage set. Right, that's what William Kent did. He was actually a stage set and watercolorist, um, stage set designer. And it really is this thin thing, right? This, this, uh, this veneer, if you will, of this relationship between republicanism and self-governance as symbol. So what happens actually in that same period is our country is founded and it's no wonder that we live with a language of government buildings looking like Roman temples and we adopted the lawn even though we shouldn't have um, in the context of our environment but it's that symbol that becomes important in the context of the work that we do. 
But that symbol is veneer. It's incredibly thin, right? It's this notion that it is as vulnerable as any tabletop with a veneer on it. If you smash it, it will fall apart. It will expose the sort of stuff that's beneath that veneer. So in the context of public protest and the relationship that we have to our own landscape, we use these environments to express ourselves for good and for bad. And the notion being that that environment is indeed a representation of ourselves and how we use it becomes incredibly important to the descriptions of our own society, whether good or bad. And, and in the landscape of our environments, we, we confront each other in the context of those notions, which is why landscape is an, empower, an incredibly powerful tool when utilized well in the context of how people engage with each other. So when you think about the broad horizon view, that spectrum of, of our own society in the context of the connective tissue, um, you have to remember that there are many voices out there, some of challenge, some of resonance, but need to be as diverse as any of the ecological environments that we hold dear. So that the vulnerability and polarization that we see in the context of our environmental challenges are equally challenged in the context of how we speak with one another. And we have to remember that describing environments in which conversations can take place and that they are resilient in the capacity to hear all voices becomes incredibly powerful as a tool. When more people live in cities than they ever have in human history, it becomes incredibly important to recognize that that is a place of great conversation and opportunity, and that the notion of uh, polarization and extremes um, is something that we have to be equally attentive to in the context of both ecology and the sociology of our own self-governance. So for me, the big question ends up being, what is the assimilative capacity of human beings? Where is that tipping point at which we cannot move further anymore? And how do we stabilize ourselves in the context of conversation where opportunities and ideas are heard, not just listened to, and that we leave no one behind to allow for the vulnerabilities of dissonance and polarization? So um, we think about ourselves in the context of this great blue orb and um, the fragility of it, and we have to not forget that we are the, the species that makes every decision for every every other living creature on this planet. And that if we want to be successful, we have to love and appreciate ourselves and the capacity to do good in the context of all that we, we understand. Because in the end, we are extremely small and irrelevant. We have to make our own relevance in the context of the galaxies that surround us. And so with that, I invite you to believe in gravity. Thank you. So, Bill, I hope I didn't get you kicked out, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we'll take some questions now, but I do, I would like to start out with one. And you brought up this phrase, mean people suck. <laughs> <laughs> Can you think of anyone? I can, think, I can think of a couple of people that have promoted meanness in the context of governance. Um, I, I don't mean to name names. I, I don't think we need to do that, but there are many. I think there are many more voices that allow for kindness in the context of what we do. And we have to recognize that meanness has come about as a result of the polarization of peoples and that we have forgotten some along the way. And that because more people live in cities by choice and by fact, um, we choose to live within diversity in the context of the urban environments that we, in which we thrive, where culture is uplifted and shown. And that our system of governance, in particular our capacity to vote, is represented both by popular vote and by um, the electoral college, which is, was originally intended to balance out city from countryside. But more people live in cities than we ever have. And we, in, in our lifetime, we have seen two popular presidents lose their elections as a result of the electoral college system. Um, and I fear that that's going to happen many more times in my lifetime until we course correct uh, that, that uh, notion. Okay, are there questions? Nope. Hello. Hi, I'm Sandra Favor. Oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> my apologies. 
I, I love the way you put together so many different concepts. And I'd like to affirm doing that because I'm trying to do that myself. And I'd like to add a concept. And that is, you mentioned empathy. I, I really think that that's the secret that we need to have in order. You have to take something, an animal, a person, a planet, inside your tent. And once it's inside your tent, you will protect it. But there's an element of empathy that we don't have yet that I think is really crucial. And that's empathy for the future. And I think our challenge is whether or not we as a species have that built into our DNA. And if we don't, can we actually cultivate that? Because it's all very well to think about people here and now. But if you don't think about people a million years from now, you will not prepare now in order to make a future available to them. Beautifully said, beautifully said. It's the future light cone extending beyond the union of two people to many people, right? And the notion that there is progression in the context of that and that time goes on with or without us, we are irrelevant to the construct of time. Um, if the planet fails, if we fail, there will still be a, a blue orb or it might be gray or some other thing, but it will still be here well beyond us. And so being stewards, not just of ourselves, but of our grandnieces and grandnephews is incredibly important, absolutely. Hi. Regna Darnell, hi. Regna Darnell, um, Western Ontario. Um, I come to the question of empathy through cross-cultural evidence, and I think it's clear that coming from empathy to conversation is spreading even within our mainstream world. What I don't see is how that's getting into public discourse. It seems to be something that a generation much younger than I am is understanding to be about the way they live their private lives. And I think that one could accept your idea of public space without necessarily seeing how it gets into governance. Could you comment on that? Uh, I might have to ask for a little bit more elaboration, just because you're much smarter than I am. And, uh, but the, in the, uh, the notion being that uh, 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 it can, as an individual in the context of, of empathy, it's much easier to map. In the context of public open space, it's, it's much more difficult. Um, I think where, where I would answer that question is to recognize that uh, uh, the description of space and how we de de design space is actually much more important than how we design object. Um, and that the capacity to design for conversation rather than, say, temple structure uh, or object in the middle of space, or in the case of what we've seen most recently, um, monuments that define public space. The monument actually should be the, to the capacity to have dialogue, not to some uh, ideologue or some, uh, some statue that suggests uh, manipulation, as did the uh, intrusion of uh, uh, heraldic uh, southern conquerors in the context of Jim Crow era public spaces, right? The notion that object-centric spaces are less valuable and the more valuable are those that are designed to promote, to promote dialogue. Question right here. Bob Jervis uh, really picks up on one aspect of the last question. I wonder how the design of effective landscapes is changed by one particular aspect of all our electronics, which is a change of the public and private. Now you see people in public but wearing these odd <laughs> the earbuds, which are essentially private. And yet also, people again in public spaces, walking down the street, are talking on their cell phones, which is a private function now being in public. So how can you design uh, landscapes to meet your objective with this sort of strange inversion or complication of the public and private? Yeah. I think it even goes further in the notion that a lot of a lot of public discourse actually happens in the context of very uh, within the ether, and that it's a zone of engagement that actually is less broad than people think, because to this day, and as we've understood. Uh, uh, people receive the information that they want to receive, not centric information that might speak to all points. So when you can shop for your news um, in the context of discourse, that becomes significantly problematic because it only adds to polarization, not to 
uh, education through an understanding of of centrism or or a spectrum of thinking. Um, the the what has been interesting uh, for me uh, in the context of the work that we've done for, say, a, a Fortune 200 company called Cummins uh, Engineer uh, Engineering, uh, they design diesel engines. Um, we they are defining their new work environment for the 21st century as a place where people can choose where they want to be most effective, meaning they can choose within their buildings to uh, sit, to stand, to run at their desk, to work in clusters, to work as individuals, to work as neighborhoods. And we d ended up defining landscapes for their uh, corporate headquarters that could receive the capacity to work in that choosing outside, but that those outside environments were not just private spaces, but publicly accessible private spaces where a citizen could also come in and partake in dialogue, both electronically and verbally. And uh, so um, I think that uh, progressive thinkers are, are beginning to realize that um, the alienation due to uh, smaller and smaller electronics, like this one that's using to record this event, um, uh, are actually uh, about to uh, get uh, to the point where they explode back out, and uh, that that they will be uh, used for um, progressive thinking uh, between very different sorts of people. That's the aspiration. There's a question here. Um, hi, Howard Gardner. Um, one thing which you didn't mention, and I think you deliberately didn't mention, but Bob Jervis's question made me think about it, is the role of religion or other spiritual um, connectors. Because I think because of what Bob said, uh, physical space pay, pays less importance now to many people, especially younger people, because they're connecting in virtual space. And religion has, you know, traditionally, whether you like it or not, been the way that people, you know, connect uh, horizontally and vertically. So, how do you think about your um, your problematic with reference to um, organized or new religions? Um. Space has always always played a, a role in the context of uh, uh, the organization organization of religious thinking, whether it's. Uh uh, the notion in architecture that there is an individual standing at a pulpit preaching to the masses or in a Quaker institution uh, sitting in the round in the context of engagement and conversation and, and thought. Um, I think that actually, uh, uh, regardless of uh, religious thinking or secularism, uh, space will always play a role in the context of, of that capacity to converse and be thoughtful. Um, Religious thinking is actually, from my perspective, from the outside, truthfully, um, about uh, self-reflection and self-governance and trying to do good in the context of understanding other people. We self-select as human beings, anthropologically, we choose to be like with people of like mind, of uh, uh, like uh, physiognomy, of likeness. Um, so. In the context of the work that I do, I'm always trying to get people to recognize that beyond those visible uh, uh, attributes, um, there is actually significantly more happening within the, within the individual, um, and that uh, designing spaces to share thought ends up becoming uh, the powerful tool. It's, it has been appropriated by religions uh, uh, since the beginning. I'm just saying it needs to go beyond that in the context of, of, of governance and, uh, and self. I will say that younger people, uh, in the context of the work that we do, are seeking experience over genuflecting to cultural artifact. And that uh, venues um, now are being designed experientially um, and not about singular uh, um, engagement. It has to not only happen in the context of being memorialized, um, often the more ephemeral events are the things that are most attractive to younger generations, right? But that you have to design space to have the capacity to adapt and be resilient to those changes and the capacity to understand experience. Um, we have one final question over here. Uh, this follows, uh, Rosie Abella, this follows on the question about religion. I'm wondering, since you've really done a magnificent job of turning landscape architecture into a new philosophy of how to look at community, um, how you deal with what seems to some of us who are not from the United States as the new religion here, and that is freedom of expression, which has no limits. And in public spaces where you have an environment where speech is a religion and there are no restrictions on it, and where everyone in 
a polarized environment, has his or her own uh, version of what truth is, how do you get to empathy, which is listening with an open mind to what other people are actually saying? Yeah, yeah. beautifully said. I w I, that is absolutely the conundrum of our future, right? Uh, that if we self-identify as a culture um, about self-expression, um, as being the thing that is tantamount to describing ourselves, um, and we recognize that every point can or cannot be right, you know, in the context of oneself thinking and then expressing it out, it comes with prejudice and that each of us comes to uh, engagement with prejudice. We are all vulnerable to that. And in my, my work, I do a lot of public engagement going into uh, communities uh, significantly challenged, left behind, um, not appreciated for their own vitality, and have to, I register to people as a middle-aged white man, but I'm actually, you know, uh, I, I identify with the LGBTQ community, and I'm a secular humanist, and there's so much more to my DNA than what people first see, and you have to uh, establish trust and the capacity uh, to recognize that there's a capacity to listen. And um, it's that notion, as you suggest, that nobody hears the other person anymore. That we have actually, because we have chosen, or we have the capacity to choose where we get our information and speculate on its veracity, um, that we ourselves uh, become uh, um, I don't know, sort of uh, embraced in our own cocoon, right? Nar well, narcissistic, exactly. We cannot think beyond ourselves. And uh, this notion of design problem solving is actually the capacity to think beyond yourself to the challenges of your clients and their constituents, not yourself. Um, I will end by saying I do have hubris, right? The work that we do, if you come and see it, is actually quite defining, but it doesn't say me. It says the success of the people for whom we're working, whether it's a city or a community or a, a campus. So, but your notion is actually the penultimate question, absolutely. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you all very much. <laughs>